Um, I'm just gonna start by showing Foundry's showreel. So hi, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, today uh, we're going to be talking about streamlining procedural workflows in Mari. So just to give you guys a bit of a background about myself, um, my name is Charlie and I'm a Mari QA engineer. Um, so I've been at Foundry for about three years, um, working with the Mari support team and then moving into the Mari development team. And for like about two of those years, I was absolutely terrified of using the Mari node graph. Um, today we're going to be talking about actually uh, what the no graph is from the ground up, uh, what convinces artists and including myself to start using it and how you can use it to improve your painting experience in Mari. Um, so what is the node graph? So when we look at artists coming into industry and even those who've been using Mari for quite some time, um, we find that most artists have a background in fine art or digital art and usually have been trained in applications like Photoshop. So as an artist, when you're creating an image, you usually visualize it from the bottom up. You start with the background, and then the midground, the foreground, and then the details. So in this sense, using a layer stack like we have here in Mari um, is actually incredible, uh, incredibly natural for an artist to use. So when we look at the node graph, it's a little bit more off-putting. And to me, when I came into Mari and realized there was a node graph, this was terrifying. But at its core, the NoGraph is actually just a way of uh, viewing and managing your project. Um, it's completely non-destructive, exactly the same as the layer stack. And really, the only difference is that it can be quite overwhelming for an artist that isn't familiar from this way of working. Um, so the easiest way to get started in the NoGraph is just to compare it to its layer stack counterpart. So here we have um, a simple layer and channel. Under the hood, Mari is actually creating these nodes, even if you are working in a layer stack project. Um, the, the node graph here is simply um, a single channel, the base color channel. It is the bottom of the layer stack and one layer, which is called diffuse color. So that's the paint node and the merge node connected and the channel is the diffuse head gear feeding into the principal BRDF shader. So when we add a new layer, a new paint node is created like this, and it's merged into the channel stream. So applying the same logic to materials, to other procedurals, and any other node or layer type, we basically have the first building blocks of creating a clean node graph in the Mari network. But you might ask, well, why do we need to use the Mari node graph? I already know how to use layers. Well, the truth is, having visited a number of clients in Foundry, and even when I was a student and I was learning from artists at events like this, a lot of them were still using the layer stack and that's very much the same now. A lot of artists are still using layer stack in industry. Unfortunately, the truth is layers just aren't that efficient. Um, and Mari is an incredibly versatile piece of software, but that also means that you can get really stuck in creating entire layers that if you can add a mass stack 
and then an adjustment stack, and then a mask to that ma mask stack, and then another adjustment stack, which is really great that Mari can do that, but is completely confusing if anyone else needs to ever take a look at that project. And nowadays, there's actually um, it's an increasing need for faster, more effective archives, but without uh, negatively affecting the results of the final project. And we know that artists don't have any more time in industry to complete their projects, but they're getting, we, we see the escalation of VFX nowadays, right? It's getting more and more real. People need to be giving um, better results in less time. Over in London, we're actually seeing quite a lot of the industry studios are adapting the node graph and a large number of them are now almost exclusively using it in their workflow. So using the procedural networks um, allows them to respond quickly and also adapt to the projects with ease. Uh, working in NoGraph has made it easier for artists to self-manage the complex scenes that they're working with without worrying about the shared layers and mass stack chaos that I mentioned before. Um, and when combining this with the proceduralism of Mari's, um, for instance, the cloud node, the Voronoi, and um, even the new Mari 4 material system, you find that if a change occurs in your asset and you need to update the object, 90% of the work is all, almost done for you if you just change the object in Mari. And it leaves you more time to focus on the actual fun parts of texturing, the painting, the masks, and the actual details rather than those base materials. So to give you guys an idea of how how many people are afraid of the node graph. I'll tell you my own story. Um, so a few months into me starting my time at Foundry, um, we had a big exec level meeting. So it was all the higher ups at Foundry discussing the different products and what was going well with them. And I distinctly remember the senior product manager of Mari discussing how much everybody was enjoying the node graph. And I remember him asking, is there anyone here who doesn't like the node graph? And there was a complete pause across the room. And I was like, oh, I've been here three months. Can I, can I say this? And I just slowly raised my hand. And I was just like, I, I don't like the node graph. I don't want to use Nuke. I want to paint in Mari. And that's actually what a lot of artists still think. We want, to, we want to paint. We want to feel like we're doing something creative. And using nodes doesn't necessarily feel like it's part of an artistic uh, method. Um, I, as I said in the beginning, it took me two years of working at Foundry in Mari to convince myself that I was going to sit down and learn this node graph. And actually, I was really wrong. And now I can't change out of the node graph, and I love it. So it's not just you if you don't like the list, uh, if you don't like the node graph, everyone is in the same boat. So when we talk about the disadvantages of the node graph, that fear factor is number one. We actually find that a lot of the disadvantages of the node graph are more cosmetic rather than actual problems created by the workflow. So as I said, fear factor. Everyone who's unfamiliar with the workflow doesn't want to learn it. Um, and layers feel more artistic. They simply are more intuitive for an artist to use. That's just the fact. Um, graphs, can be Sorry. Uh, graphs can be chaotic. As you saw before in the opening slide, and as you'll see later on, if you've been working in a layer stack project and then you accidentally or intentionally open the node graph and you see your project converted in nodes, it can be quite, quite overwhelming. Uh, as you'll see from later on, though, this is something that we're trying to work hard on improving. Um, learning curve. There is a learning curve. If you're coming from layers, you, you need to commit the time to um, understanding how your layers are being represented in nodes. But once you do that, it's pretty good. And most importantly, it does require you to maintain your data. Um, so under the hood, the um, the layer stack is doing a lot of voodoo magic and converting your color data and your scalar data to what it knows it needs to be. If you've created a scalar data channel, so like your bump or your spec, and you make a color layer, Mari knows that that needs to be scalar data and it's automatically setting that. In the node graph, you need to remember to do that yourself. And that can be quite challenging for artists to remember to do. Um, 
even in this asset here, which is an incredible asset um, created by Michael Wilde, who is an amazing texture artist in industry. When I looked at this project, you can see some of the nodes are still switched to color data when they shouldn't be. And it, it can work, it still looks great, but knowing what that data should be can, can, uh, can significantly improve your project and you can go through, switch that off and remove the nodes that you put in there to adjust, um, make things grayscale and act like they were scalar when you didn't need to. So on the other side, there's actually quite a few advantages to using the node graph. It is non-destructive. Everything is live and only your paint nodes are baked down unless you're using a bake point. Um, but even with even in that case, you can just go and adjust any node at any point and it will update live. It is the best of both worlds. It's combining procedural techniques and it's not limiting your ability to paint as an artist. It's reusable. Um, we find that quite a lot of projects, either you, maybe you've created a material and you want to share that into a new project. That's so easy to do in the node graph. You just export the nodes out and re-import them in. Uh, it's versatile. You can use it for any kind of project, really. And it has small, uh, smaller file sizes. We find it's quite efficient and optimal uh, because there's less shared layers amongst layer stack. And it's contextually accurate. There's no need to have a second screen in industry. A lot of people have a second screen that is just their layers palettes, all of their different channels or a custom palette they've created and just so they can see everything in context at once. In the no graph, everything is there in front of you at all the time. So we're aware there isn't a great deal of documentation available on the no graph out there. So I wanted to take the opportunity to just go through some of the like, need to know basics of Mari's no graph for anyone who's looking to start out in it. Example of a layers project in the node graph looking hideous and incredibly confusing. Um, one of the most important things to handle early on when you want to create a node graph project is that self-organization. So whilst many artists work on an asset from start to finish, it's not uncommon for them to be shared between artists when someone's priority changes, someone leaves a role, or even if you're changing it between shows, perhaps there's a sequel, it's moving to a different company and you want to send things over. In this case, it's really beneficial to be able to pick up the archive and just run with it. And this is incredibly complicated to do if the layer stack is full of shared layers, shared channels, shared masks going everywhere, and someone really just wants to use it now. So in order to create a well-organized node graph, we should understand a few um, basic guidelines and good practices to use between artists. The first being that typically, uh, the Mari node graph, unlike Nuke, um, is arranged horizontally from left to right rather than vertically which is similar to Maya's hypershade. Um, due to this reason, it's usual for the artist to try and maintain a consistent base stream from left to right that feeds all the way into the shade and node whilst merging in the elements via the over input, which is typically below. Um, the nodes and groups are used for masks then below them and you can see them reflected in the inputs in the merge node. Very easy to understand. So if you're using a material workflow, you'll need to use the multi-channel merge instead, which is really scary to look at. But if we just collapse it down and go inside into the subgraph, you can just see that it's actually just a bunch of merge nodes inside connecting your different streams. And it's just a container. Nothing at all to worry about. Uh, so beyond that, the multi-channel merge is simply just a merge node uh, for two materials. It's your base material and your over material. However, it does rely on you maintaining a consistent shader model. So you can see here, I'm using a principal BRDF shader network. So that's something that I would have uh, created in this sense. I would have created it in the node graph as a node. However, if you created it in the shaders palette, that's still the same. That's exactly what it looks like. And you'll have to use that shader model throughout. Um, so when you create a material node or a multi-channel merge node, you'll be prompted with this dialog here and you can just pick from your shaders and then they'll match up. So as of 4.6, collapsible states are actually present in all of the nodes. And you can cycle through these by clicking the button on the right node or hitting the tilde button. So there's expanded, fully collapsed, connected only, and the multi-channel merge nodes, as you saw in the slide before, have stream collapsed which is the base over and mask. If you want to manipulate a node in Mari, it's exactly the same. Double click it, 
and it acts just as it would in the layer properties. You can see here, it's just a color node would be the exact same as a color procedural layer, and it's just updating live. And it's the same for any of the nodes. Uh, if your node properties palette isn't already open, it's just at the side there with the little node graph and the cog. So working in the node graph without self-organization and restraint can be really, really chaotic. If you click L and it will auto-place your nodes and attempt to lay them out in a neater arrangement. If you used Mari 4.5, uh, if anyone has, you'll know that we didn't necessarily have this working out too great with the longer nodes. This is Mari 4.6, our next version to be released. You can see we've put a lot of effort into getting this looking nicer. So, um, is anyone here familiar with caching? Yeah? Do you guys actually use it or just know what it is? Yes, okay, cool. Um, so, in the layer stack, uh, this is a, an example of an archive uh, layer stack that I got from a uh, from an industry project. Whenever I was in Mari support, we'd have people complaining that their assets were really slow. I'd say, okay, send it over to me and I'll take a look. And I'd get it, and the very first thing I would do is cache that layer stack because, yeah, it was laggy, but everything is live. And you can see the visual indicator of how strenuous that's being on the shader and the performance. Um, it's incredible how many people don't know to do that to optimize their, um, their projects. And really, in the node graph, it's even easier. You can use the bake point nodes here. And your data isn't, un unlike the cache layer stack, you need to uncache it if you want to manipulate it again. With the bake point nodes, you can simply adjust it at any point. This bake point node will turn red to show that it's dirty and then that needs to be rebaked. It's very easy to do. So you can see here, uh, baking the stream to different resolutions. Um, it will show, depending on which size you pick, different resolutions in your viewport. It's not damaging any of your data at all. You can change that at any point. And you can also export out from the bake point nodes as well. So here in the export manager, I was just adding it as an export option. For instance, if I wanted to export a channel out, I can use it that way. So in general, you should try to do these few things. You should try to keep your network clean. I didn't mention it, but renaming your nodes is really important, um, especially if you're about to work in a material workflow. You don't want to have to try and figure out which cloud node is responsible for what. You don't want to have, is it cloud one? Is it cloud two, cloud three? Rename your nodes based on the stream. I generally like to add uh, the stream name, the effect it has, underscore CLR if it's a color node, so that I know what it is. GRP if it's a group node, MRG if it's merged, just so I can see at a glance what that is without having to go into my node graph and figure that out. Um, if you prefer, use backdrops as visual aids when node graphs get really big, though it's really good to uh, know at a glance what color, the, oh, these are my masks, I'll go into these. Use groups if you want to, and definitely use bake points. So by taming these kind of basic formulas as you build up your node graph, you'll avoid any really confusion on what noodle is connected to where, and at a glance you should be able to pinpoint where your elements are. Ultimately, the node graph can be organized any way that you feel. Uh, for instance, you may prefer to have a collection of nodes exposed at your root node level so that you can go in and manipulate and see. However, you might also want to have them grouped so you can hide these away and declutter your node graph at top level and you can go into the subgraph to change these if you need to. But ultimately, knowing what works best for you and for your studio will significantly improve your efficiency and can also help you have the best techniques for sharing content between artists and even between the shows. So there's many different ways to use Mari's node graph. Uh, it can be used throughout the full texturing pipeline from material offering to baking out finalized textures. Uh, I've highlighted three key areas here, material creation, texture painting, and problem solving. 
So earlier this year, with Mari 4.5e1, we introduced the Mari Materials system, and it's been encouraging a lot more artists to take advantage of the node graph for material designing. So creating a material can be done in one of two ways. You can see here, this is a procedural material that I made. Um, it's fully procedural, there's no images involved in this. It is just simply a lot of cloud nodes, Perlin noise, and just color. Um, and it's a really great way to build up, node, uh, build up materials from scratch. Um, so this is me creating a material. It's about 15 minutes, but I've condensed it down. Um, so you can see that I'm just creating, at the moment, sticking to the base stream and just focusing on that one stream at a time, building up one node. This is me just throwing in some quick base values uh, for the streams that I know I'll be using as well. Um, I'm not necessarily looking for accuracy at the beginning, but I want to just try and get something down to start with. So I know in my mind that this is going to be a, uh, a gold or some kind of metal. So I'm just going through and trying to get a base for that here. Then I'm gonna go in and add my base values for the metallic, for the roughness, and if I'm gonna use the normal and bump. And you can see that I'm jumping a little bit between the user shader and viewing the streams. And you can see that I used the um, node naming convention I mentioned there earlier. Um, so it's good to constantly double check that you're working, um, not just in the user shader, which can be quite heavy, but also checking your stream individually as well. Start renaming the node something useful, and you'll see in that these color nodes here, this little toggle, if I jump over really briefly, if it appears, and now it's not going to appear. But if you see next to the color nodes, um, there's a little toggle there, and I'll be switching those off on my scalar data. That's how you maintain that in the node graph. Um, if I skip ahead a little bit, I think I can. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so you can see here the, this is the toggle I mentioned. So these are color at present. And if it's on a scalar stream, I am converting, like just click those off and they'll change to grayscale. And that's me converting them. This spanner icon here is how you promote it up to a material level. And you'll see that I'm just, if you continue, I've been promoting some of those up. And it's also just good to check your material in multiple different lighting conditions as you go as well, just to double check that it's looking realistic-ish. Um, so the second way of creating a material is with the ingest tool. Unfortunately, I don't have a video to show you guys. I was gonna show you live, but it's quite complicated um, to set up. So. This is the easiest way to create material. Um, you can see, so the material ingest tool, you open, you can open in any project. Um, you simply choose a preset. So you see at the top, I have CCO textures selected. We have presets for quite a lot of things, uh, a lot of sources available. We have Quixel, we have Substance, we have CCO, we have Texture Haven, textures.com. Um, and you just simply search for images on your uh, on your machine, and then Mari will build them for you. And it's a really great way to import something as a base starting point, or even if you have a material that you've made somewhere else and you wanna bring it in, but you wanna uh, continue to tweak that then in the node graph, you can do that really easily. So before the material system, um, creating and sharing material groups wasn't entirely impossible. So when we'd go to studios, we'd see quite a lot of networks that looked something like this, but at a higher level. Um, it simply just required the artist to understand what they were doing with the node graph. So entire networks can be created to represent the material. So you can see there in that backdrop, I have, for instance, gold, and these nodes are not just the base stream, they are every stream of that material. And then these would just simply be merged into the actual project stream and masked out. And we found that like, a lot of studios were working with this in some interpretation or another before the material system came along. Um, so working with materials makes this a lot easier. I have all of my materials in my shelf. 
I can simply just drag and drop them into my node graph, connect them up, and now I can just focus on creating my masks and the more artistic part of playing around in Mari. I simply just add a paint node, as I will do here. Yep, yeah, add a paint node. That's black, it's a completely transparent mask. And then I can just uh, paint where I want or I can select a selection group and set that to white. In this instance, you can combine it even with Mari's paint buffer tools. So I'm gonna combine it with um, Mari's mirror projection tool, which was an awesome feature that came out in Mari 4.2. Um, and you can see that I can still use that even in the node graph. You really don't limit yourself at all working with the node graph. You can still make, the, uh, make use of Mari's best features this way. And you should see that I can paint with symmetry just fine on that node. I'm very slow at texturing, aren't I? <laughs> cool. And you can see that when I do that, it's me not just painting one layer, it's painting all of those layers. It's the entire material that's been applied in that section. So it's a really easy way to quickly build up projects. Um, this asset is really all material based, but it's something that it really didn't take me that long to create. So the last thing I mentioned was uh, using Mari for problem solving, which isn't necessarily something I can show but it is something that's very important. So you can definitely use the node graph to debug your layers projects. Um, this, we find that if you have a layers project and you don't know why it's running slowly or you're confused as to what's happening with it, maybe something's gone wrong, opening the node graph and just going in and locating the layers that you think there might be an issue with really is an easy way to quickly find where the issues are. And when you have projects that have shared layers and shared masks, going into that node graph and seeing what it's actually doing under the hood is a great way for artists to actually start seeing how they can streamline their workflows by going in and cutting down and seeing where they don't need this noodle connected to this node. Actually, I can just do this in a different way with one node. I've got four nodes, uh, four layers doing the same job as one. Maybe I should go in and fix that. And in general, doing uh, cutting down and maintaining those projects or even just having a node graph project instead of a layer stack project will mean that you have lower file sizes overall and it's just easier to manage. So Mari 4.6 and beyond, as I mentioned, uh, Mari 4.6 v1 is gonna be our next version. I don't know if anybody in the room has used the beta, it's currently in public, awesome. Um, did you enjoy it? You like it? Yeah, GeoChannels is gonna be our best feature. Um, so it's a great step forwards for us to, uh, it really shows the effort we're making to try and improve the node graph user experience for everyone. So GeoChannels, as you mentioned, uh, are, they're object-based image sets um, that are being introduced in 4.61. So GeoChannel nodes can be added to material presets and they allow you to design more advanced materials that drive the look from the image maps such as the curvature or, or the ambient inclusion. Um, so we've also extended the bait point node to sync, um, sync to GeoChannel. And that allows you to bake this, any image set, even if that is created her up in your node graph to a GeoChannel, which means you can use the bait point nodes as a transmitter and you can use them at any other point at feed that geo channel somewhere else in your node graph, meaning that you don't have to have nodes at noodles across all of your node graph linking them up. You can use them to transmit from A to B. Uh, we've also added a lot new procedural patterns into 4.631, which will enable people to um, create more complex non-destructive node networks and materials inside their projects. And also it's just really cool. It's something that we know that uh, users have wanted more of in Mari for a really long time now, and we're making an effort to try and put more procedurals in there for people. 
Um, and perhaps my favorite one is projection node. So projection node, uh, projection and camera projection can be used in different ways. Here I'm projecting this image from a locator, which you can see me moving around. But this is actually a material that's been created in full PBR as well. So there's really no limit to what you can use the projection nodes for. And it's just really cool that you can project full PBR materials onto another material and start really building up these advanced uh, complex projects in a really easy way. I mean, this is, if I could show you guys now, these images uh, are from CCO Textures, and it's really only a few nodes that it took me to create something like this that could really apply to a lot of different projects. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, we know that Mari's NoGraph has been a little bit of an enigma for a while now. Um, with that in mind, I wanted to let you guys know about a few key resources that will help you both as a new and an experienced artist. Um, so first of all, the Foundry Online Help. We have been working really hard to put together new node documentation that you'll find in our online help um, that helps break down each of our nodes for easy di digesting. Uh, this will go live with the 4.6 v1 release and you'll find a, a lot more information there than there was previously. So definitely check that out. Um, Michael Wild, the artist that I mentioned earlier, uh, he has helped us out with a new uh, course for Mari, Mari 4, uh, Fundamentals and Best Practice. Really great Nodegraph-based projects and he walks you through several different levels of his painting techniques with that. Um, and he's also done a how-to uh, video for Nodegraph Basics. So if you want in-depth, definitely, uh, definitely look at his full tutorial. If you want easy digestion and get just the basics so you can get started, the second one is great. And finally, I wanted to mention uh, MeshMen Studio, which some people might know as the Mari channel before they rebranded. Um, it's run by two guys, one of which is Peter Aviston, who is a lead texture artist in industry. And he does a lot of blogging and videos about Mari Nodegraph and about using Mari in general, which are a great resource. And you should definitely take a look at them. And yeah, that's kind of all I have to say. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything or want to complain about any bugs they might have in Mari? I can attempt to help. <laughs> no? Cool. Okay, yeah. Thanks, hi. Um, just a question, um, not generally, but it's Mari question. As you mentioned, you have new bricks and new, like, couple of procedurals. But also, I've been using Extension Pack for, like, four years now, or yep. I don't know how many long and they just released the newest version, which has a lot of stuff in yeah. So how do you guys, do you communicate with Jens, or do you like co-develop, or? Um, so we don't co-develop. Uh, we are constantly talking to Jens about uh, Mario Extension Pack, and what he's put out in the last week is really awesome, really great. Um, we are in a good relationship with him, and we definitely, have a back and forth about where Mari's going. He's very aware about 4.6 v1, and I know he's looking to adapt the extension pack to work with uh, Geo Channels in the future uh, once it's released. Um, but no, we don't, we don't co-develop with Jens. Thanks. But we all want the same thing, right? <laughs> <Because> <laughs> okay. Well, if anyone does have any questions, feel free to grab me at any other point. Uh, but thank you very much for coming. Thank you.